Hello friends, today we will discuss all the concepts related to Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1952. This topic is a part of IPCC Paper 2, Law, Ethics and Communication and it's numbered as Chapter 5. And as for me, I am C.A. Paridhi Sina, your mentor for this particular chapter. Friends, let's check out what's the main objective of the Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provision Act. Here, the main intention is to enforce all the provisions related to three things. Firstly, a Provident Fund scheme. Secondly, a pension scheme. And thirdly, deposit linked insurance scheme. Let's consider the most important concept of the chapter. You could get an out and out theoretical question that please explain the Provident Fund Scheme as per Section 6. The entire answer would be completed in six simple points. Firstly, the scheme has to be framed by the central government in the official gazette. The scheme should provide for Provident Fund benefits. Once the scheme is framed, the Provident Fund will be set up. The fund would be administered by the Central Board of Trustees. The employer would contribute maximum 10% of the basic wages and dearness allowance and retaining allowance. The employee would contribute minimum 10% of basic wages plus dearness allowance plus retaining allowance. And the final point is that this scheme would provide for all the matters which are specified in Schedule 2 of this Act. Let's consider an out and out theory question on the pension scheme. The entire answer would be completed in six simple points. Here we go. The scheme should be framed by the central government in a document called the Official Gazette. The scheme should provide for pension benefits. Once the scheme is framed, the employer should set up a pension fund. This fund should be administered by the Central Board of Trustees. The employer will contribute 8.3% of basic wages, dearness allowance and retaining allowance. The scheme should provide for all the matters which are specified in Schedule 3 of the Act. Another theoretical question for you is the deposit linked insurance scheme as per Section 6C. The scheme should be framed by the Central Government in the Official Gazette. The scheme will provide for life insurance benefits and once the scheme is framed, a fund would be set up and this would be administered by the Central Board of Trustees. The employer would contribute 1% of the basic wages plus dearness allowance plus retaining allowance. Finally, this scheme should provide for all the matters which are specified in Schedule 4 of the Act. Friends, let's consider the exact meaning of the Central Board of Trustees and also the composition of the Central Board of Trustees. The Central Board of Trustees is constituted by way of a notification in the Official Gazette by the Central Government. The Central Board of Trustees will manage the Provident Fund, Pension Fund, Insurance Fund, which is set up under Section 6, 6A and 6C respectively. The Central Board of Trustees will consist of the following persons and each of them will be appointed by the Central Government. The Central Board of Trustees will comprise of, firstly, the Central Provident Fund Commissioner, the Chairman, Vice Chairman, maximum 15 central government and state government officials and finally maximum 10 representatives of the employer and employees each. Now, what about an executive committee? The executive committee has been described in section 5 AA. The executive committee is constituted by way of a notification in the official gazette by the central government. The main objective of setting up the Executive Committee is to assist the functions of the Central Board of Trustees. 
It consists of the following persons and please remember each of them would be appointed by the central government. The central provident fund commissioner, the chairman, maximum two central government officials and finally maximum three central government officials and representatives of the employer and employees each. Let's consider the meaning of an employee. Only that employee who would be defined under Section 2 F would be eligible to claim the benefits of Provident Fund, Pension and Insurance. So, let's check out who are these employees. An employee over here would mean any person including an apprentice and employed even indirectly through a contractor. And finally, please remember that employer has the same meaning which is given in Payment of Bonus Act 1965. Let's consider the establishment to which this act is applicable. Now why this is important? If and only if you are an employee defined under Section 2 and that too of an establishment covered under Section 1, Subsection 3, then only you will have a right to claim provident fund, pension and insurance benefits. So let's check out step by step in six points what kind of establishments are covered under section 1, subsection 3. So here we go. Firstly, it's applicable to every factory. But the factory should fulfill two conditions. Condition number one, the factory should be engaged in a schedule 1 industry. And condition number two, such a factory should have minimum 20 employees. Then, any establishment with minimum 20 employees. But please remember that once the number of employees crosses 20, this act will be applicable even if subsequently the number of employees falls below 20. Fair enough. Any establishment which would be notified by way of a notification in the official gazette by the central government even if lesser than 20 employees. Here, there's an additional and interesting point that the employer and the majority of the employees can make an application to the Central Provident Fund Commissioner and if he is satisfied, he would make this act applicable to such an establishment. So, broadly, there are four categories. Firstly, a factory. Secondly, an establishment with 20 employees. Thirdly, an establishment notified by the appropriate government. And fourthly, voluntarily where they approach the Central Provident Fund Commissioner. A frequently asked question is, what is the minimum contribution under Section 6? Here we go. Just in four sentences, your entire answer will be complete. Firstly, an employee contributes minimum 10% of the basic wages plus dearness allowance plus retaining allowance. Dearness allowance is given by the employer to the employee just to cope up with the high cost of living. Retaining allowance is given by the employer to the employee in order to retain the employee. And lastly, please remember that if the contribution amount is a fraction, then it should be rounded off to the nearest rupee. Now, what about basic wages? Basic wages would mean all wages which are received in cash but excluding cash value of food, any allowance, that is, house rent allowance, dearness allowance, retaining allowance, bonus or commission, and also excluding any kind of presence from the employer. Now, what about the powers of the inspectors? The inspectors would be appointed by the government by way of a notification in the official gazette just to ensure whether the provisions of the Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act have been followed or not. But the best part for you is that the powers of the inspector are same as the Payment of Bonus Act. So you can refer to the slide given in Payment of Bonus Act for the same. Now, what about departments, undertakings and branches? The best part is that even this is the same as the content in Payment of Bonus Act, so you can refer to the relevant slide for the same. Now, please listen to this very carefully. What is the theory related to attachment of provident fund balance? 
nothing. When a person becomes insolvent, rather he is declared to be insolvent by the court, a person called the official assignee is appointed to dispose of his assets and pay off his liabilities. Such a legal assignee has been given the power of attachment of property of the insolvent person. But what about the provident fund balance? Let's check it step by step just in three simple points. Firstly, any balance in the provident fund account with the employer will not be liable for any attachment under the order of the court. The official assignee will not have any claim over this amount. And section 10 is applicable even if any balance is payable to the legal heirs of the deceased employee. So friends, you can be rest assured that section 10 acts totally and completely in favor of the employee. What are specifically exempted establishments covered under section 16? Let's consider them step by step. Firstly, section 16 gives the power to the central government to exempt certain establishments from the applicability of this act by way of a notification in the official gazette. So it's very clear that only those establishments which are stated by the central government in the notification will not be liable to make any contribution to provident fund, pension or life insurance. Following establishments are specifically exempt. Any establishment which is set up by the central government or the state government. Any establishment which is set up on the central or state act. Any newly set up establishment till three years. And lastly, any cooperative society which is having maximum 50 employees and working without the aid of power. Continuing section 16. Please remember that any other establishment may be exempted by the AG by way of a notification in the OG after considering the financial position and the relevant circumstances. Such an exemption will be granted only for a specific period and subject to certain conditions. Now, what are authorized establishments? Authorized establishments are defined under section 16. Okay. Now, this section gives the power the appropriate government to authorize certain establishments to maintain a provident fund account. Alright? The employer and a majority of the employees will make an application to the appropriate government and if the appropriate government is satisfied, then it will grant the authorization subject to the following conditions. Now, the conditions are given in the next slide. If these particular conditions are not fulfilled, then the authorization would be cancelled but only after giving an opportunity to be heard. Now that's really, really fair enough. They just can't cancel the license just like that. They definitely will have to give an opportunity to the establishment to be heard. Now let's consider what are the conditions. Firstly, the establishment should follow the terms and conditions. They should submit timely returns. They should pay the administrative charges to the government. They should also maintain the provident fund. They should provide facilities to the inspectors and also deposit the contribution into the fund. Until unless these conditions are not fulfilled, they will not be allowed to continue with their provident fund account. Now, let's consider the provision related to transfer of any provident fund balance. This is governed by Section 17 and let's check out what does Section 17 state. Section 17A permits the transfer of balance in any provident fund account in case of transfer of employment. So of course, this is an advantage where the employee leaves one employment and joins another employment. The transfer would be totally at the option of the employee. The amount could be transferred to the new establishment. It will not make any difference whether the Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act is applicable to the new establishment or not. Let's consider what are the provisions given in Section 17B related to transfer of business. See friends, when Section 17B applies, 
It states that when an establishment transfers its business to another establishment by way of sale, gift or lease, then the transferor and the transferee are jointly and severally liable for the contribution. However, the transferee is jointly liable only to the extent of the assets which are acquired from the transferor. Friends, let's consider a practical question related to Section 17b. Please read the question very, very carefully. X group of industries sold its business to Y group of industries. X group of industries has already made 25% of the contribution to PF, which was due before the date of sale. Y group of industries refused to bear the remaining 75% liability. Now, please remember, whenever any practical question appears, you have to answer in a simple three-step manner. Step number one, quote the section. Step number two, state what's happening in the above case. And step number three, give your conclusion. So friends, the same thing which I explained to you right now, if we have to pen it down, then how will it appear? Check this out. Firstly, we will write, as per section 17a or b, why have I written dot dot dot? Because you already know the contents. Then we will state in the above case. And finally, our conclusion would be that Y group of industries is definitely liable for the contribution. Friends, let's check out what's the final summary. Well, all the concepts related to Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act have been explained in the order of the sections of the Act. All the theoretical concepts have been combined with practical cases wherever possible. And for best results, you could prepare a list of sections for revision and future reference. So friends, all the best and happy studying. So friends, this is C.A. Paridhi Sinha signing off with your chapter Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience.